Prado Museum Masterpieces. The Prado Museum is this building that you see right here. It is the main museum in Madrid City. Those of you that have been to Madrid most likely have visited the museum and therefore most likely will agree with me that it is one of the great art galleries in the world. And if you have not been to Madrid yet, well, make sure you find time to visit it when you come through. And we will be talking about the Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch, which is this painting right here. Everyone's seen it before. Everyone can relate to it in some way. Um, first things first, the size, it's roughly four meters by two meters. Now, before I get some confused looks, I've done the math and that in inches is 86.6 inches by 153 inches. So it's not a small painting. And as you can see, it's also a triptych. A triptych meaning that it's three panels. There's a middle panel, there's a left panel and a right panel. And the left and right panels close onto the middle panel. Triptychs were commonly used as altarpieces. This was not the case in the, with the Garden of Earthly Delights. It would not have been appropriate as an altarpiece and we know it never hung in a church. And this is what you see when you close the panels. It's um, a wonderful painting on the backside of the, of the triptych by Hieronymus Bosch. And uh, I suppose you can see my cursor here and, and there's God and he's admiring his creation. So we're, we're in the book of Genesis. God has just created the, the world and you can decide if Hieronymus Bosch thought that the world was flat or round. I'll let you, I'll let you decide on that one. The painting, the Garden of Earthly Delights was painted roughly around the year 1490. We do not have an exact date. That's 1490. That's almost the same year as Columbus made his way westwards. So we were still debating about round worlds or flat worlds back then. Why have I chosen the Garden of Earthly Delights? Well, there are many masterpieces in the Prado Museum, many great paintings, fantastic paintings, but I've chosen the Garden of Earthly Delights because number one, it's popular. This is a typical image on a typical day in the room in the Prado Museum when you're visiting it. You will typically find a group of tourists admiring the painting and well, you might be behind the, the group or in the middle of the group. It's also an iconic image. You might not know the name of the painting, you might not know the artist, but when you see the image, you suddenly say, oh, wow, I've seen that before. It goes beyond the simple work of art. Not many paintings have achieved this status. Leonardo's Mona Lisa has, or really anything by Andy Warhol. Now, I would argue that the, the price of fame is merchandising and souvenirs, and the Prado Museum loves it. Go to the gift shop and you have lots of opportunities to purchase a coffee mug or a little toy of the Garden of Earthly Delights. I am guilty as charged. I have had a coffee mug of the Garden of Earthly Delights. And the last reason is, it is probably, most likely, the most bizarre mysterious painting in the whole Prado Museum. It poses more questions than answers. And what we're going to try to do, what I'm going to try to do with this presentation is answer some of those questions. For example, why is there a duck fish reading a book in a pond in the Garden of Earthly Delights? But before we do this, I'd like to talk just briefly about who was Hieronymus Bosch. And we don't know much about Hieronymus Bosch. We know he was an artist, obviously. He was from the Netherlands, or what we call the Netherlands now, Southern Netherlands. We know he was probably born in the year 1450, just because there's a baptismal certificate that has that date, the year at least. We know he died in 1516. We know he was uh, born as Hieronymus van Aken, as his parents were from the village of Aken, also in the Netherlands. 
We know he was born in, you will pardon my Dutch here, in the village of Schertungonbosch, or the town of Bosch. He shortened it to Bosch because he would sign his paintings as Hieronymus Bosch. Hieronymus from the village of Bosch. And we know that this village, um, this town still exists, is still in southern Netherlands, Netherlands. And at the time of Hieronymus Bosch, in the year roughly 1500, it was part of the county of Brabant. That's the southern Netherlands and northern Belgium. We know he was a devout Catholic. We know that he was married. And I believe I mentioned that we know that he was from a family of artists. Back in the day, you did what your father and grandfather did. Here's a map of the, um, the county of Brabant. You can follow my cursor. This is, we're looking at the year 1500. So right here at the top, there's the village of Hertengonbosch. That is where Hieronymus Bosch was born. If you follow the cursor a little south, there's Antwerp and there's Brussels. And then to the east, here's Luxembourg. So that kind of places this county. Remember that at the time of Hieronymus Bosch's birth, and when the Garden of Earthly Delights was painted, all of this was part of the Spanish Empire. This belonged to the Spanish crown. So in the year 1500, this was technically Spain. We also think that we know what he looked like. Here's a sketch that could be a self-portrait of himself. It's a sketch of the, the famous tree man that appears in hell, in hell, in the Garden of Earth of the Lights. It's a little closer up of what Hieronymus Bosch might have looked like. And here is Hieronymus Bosch, possibly Hieronymus Bosch, in hell as the tree man, looking over his shoulder, oblivious of what's going on around him and staring at us. There's a later portrait of Hieronymus Bosch that was, um, that was drawn after his death, almost 30 years after his death. Well, is this what he looked like? Art historians don't know. It's up to you. You can decide if there's some kind of resemblance between the gentleman to your right and the gentleman, the, the tree man to your left. This is not his wife. We don't have a portrait of his wife, but this is a portrait of a lady, a 15th century Flemish lady that lived at the time of Hieronymus Bosch. So we're going to pretend it's his wife, if anything. Well, I just like how, she, you know, the clothing she's wearing. So that is not his wife, but it could have been Bosch's wife. And here is an image of the Cathedral of St. Jan in the town of Bosch. It's a Gothic cathedral, so I am guessing that it has not changed too much since Hieronymus Bosch's time. Sadly, uh, I have not had a chance to visit the town of Bosch, yet it is on my bucket list. How did the garden get to the Prado Museum? Now let's recap very quickly here. It's a Dutch painting, painted in the Netherlands, possibly around the year 1490, and now it hangs in the Prado Museum in Madrid, Spain, year 2020, 2020. Well, it appears that the painting was either purchased or commissioned by this gentleman here, the Count Engelbert II. Engelbert II. <laughs> And we know that he had the painting around the year 1500 because an Italian traveler who visited his, visited his palace in that year talks about the painting. And the way he describes it, it can only be the Garden of Earthly Delight. So that's Engelbert II of the House of Nassau. His family and his descendants misbehave and eventually um, they trigger a revolt in Holland, or in the Netherlands rather, I think we have to call it the Netherlands now. And the 80, year, 80 years war begins, or the War of Dutch Independence. And this start, happens in 1568. So Hieronymus Bosch has already passed away. And this gentleman here, the great Duke of Alba, 
a Spaniard, the commander of the Spanish forces that were sent to um, put an end to the uprising, to this revolt in the Netherlands. At some point, we don't know how or where or why, the painting, the triptych, the garden of earthly delights ends up in this gentleman's possession, the great Duke of Alba, and he takes it back to Madrid in Spain. And he presents it or sells it, most likely presents it to Philip II, the Spanish king. This gentleman, just as a reference, in case you're not sure who he is, he's, he's the son or was the son of Charles V, the Emperor Charles V, and the great grandson of Ferdinand and Isabel, the two Spanish monarchs that sent Columbus on his way. Philip II, this gentleman here, was also a huge Hieronymus Bosch enthusiast. Almost all the paintings we have in the Prado were part of Philip II's private collection. So Philip II, takes the painting to his favorite place in Spain, the monastery of San Lorenzo de Escorial, or simply El Escorial. And this is a monastery that Philip II built during his life, and he, I, I like to call it his, uh, his second, his weekend home. When things were just too difficult and too tiring in Madrid at court, he would escape to the monastery and that's where he had his personal art collection, in this case, the Garden of Earthly Delights. And again, we know it was in the monastery because in an inventory, in the year 1600, the garden pops up. So the Garden of Earthly Delights stays at El Escorial Monastery all the way to the year 1939, where it is finally taken, or brought rather, to the Prado Museum and becomes part of the permanent collection. And since 1939, it has been on display in the Prado Museum. 1939 is an important year in Spain. Carol talked a little about it. Uh, the presentation on Monday, that's when the Spanish Civil War ended. But let's talk about the garden. Three interpretations for an uninterpretable work of art, or in other words, what is what what's what what did Hieronymus Bosch mean to say? What was he trying to say? What's the painting about? And we're going to look at three interpretations, and you can decide they all have flaws. They all have flaws, but still, there are three interpretations. I suppose all three are valid, and you can decide at the end which one you think is more plausible. The first one's the classic interpretation. Just in case you don't remember which painting we're talking about, here it is again, the Garden of Earthly Delights, with the left panel, the middle panel, and the right panel. And the classic interpretation is probably the one you are familiar with, the one that appears in many guidebooks and many websites, etc. And um, here it is, the classic interpretation. We have a classic uh, classroom with a classic teacher, classic students, and this interpretation says the following. We have the panel to our left, which is the Garden of Eden. There's no discussion about that. Here is God. He's just created Adam and Eve. And then uh, here in the middle, as described in the book of Genesis, is the tree of life or the tree of knowledge, or it's the same tree. There's discussion on that. And then there's lots of animals doing what animals do. There's an elephant and a giraffe and a unicorn, I think. So this is definitely the Garden of Eden. As it's a classic interpretation of the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. Here we have, this is not by Bosch, by, for example. This is just an image from I picked up from uh, the Middle Ages and we'd have the serpent you know, tempting Ad, uh, Adam and Eve. And here they are being expelled from the Garden of Eden. We have the middle panel. You know, things are beginning to get a bit confusing here. And this is usually where the, where the debate begins amongst art historians. I mean, what's happening here? But still, the classic interpretation suggests that this is a symbolic, I'm going to stress that, a symbolic representation of the world that we live in, or rather of the year 1500, the world that Hieronymus Bosch lived in. A symbolic representation. 
where humans are doing what humans do and eventually uh you know just being naughty and and uh, there's a lot of naughtiness if you if you may that is is happening in in this middle panel naughtiness such as depicted here that will eventually lead us to the third panel which is hell and because we're naughty because we've sinned uh, we are punished and those that um uh have been very naughty end up in hell and and um and we have a classic interpretation, I guess. I'm saying I guess because, well, Hieronymus Bosch is definitely a bit of a character when it comes to describing hell, um, of the torments in hell. So it seems clear. It seems clear. Well, perhaps not. If we look at the middle uh, panel, everyone's nude. So even if this were a symbolic representation of the year 1500 of our world as we know it, it does not make sense that everyone is running around nude. Indeed, if we go to the book of Genesis, as soon as Adam and Eve eat from the tree, they become aware of their nudity and they hide from God and they cover themselves with a fig leaf. And God, I believe, becomes the first tailor in history and gives them animal skins to cover themselves with. So it really does not make sense that Hieronymus Bosch would have depicted our current world as dozens and dozens of people running around nude. And where are the children? And where are the elderly? So even if, uh, I would argue that even if it was a symbolic representation, either Hieron Hieronymus Bosch did a very bad job or it doesn't make sense. This takes me to the Adamite interpretation. The Adamites. The Adamite interpretation would explain the middle panel. The Adamites were a sect that, um, that were around during Hieronymus Bosch's time. And their, <coughs> excuse me, and their, their idea was that they had somehow regained in their lifetimes the innocence lost in the Garden of Eden. In other words, they, they were no longer subject to the constraints of Christian morality, especially regarding sexuality. So if you were to regain the innocence lost before you ate from the apple or the tree, you would run around naked, just like Adam and Eve, and you could not sin because you were not aware of sin. You were not aware of anything. The Adamites, well, they, they uh, as you can imagine, they, uh, they must have been quite a show running around the streets of Amsterdam, as we can see in this picture, running around nude and uh, doing what they did. This would explain the middle panel, except, except for a couple considerations. Once again, there are no elderly and there are no children. So if we are describing, if, we are, if we're, we're representing the Adamites in our current 1500s, well, then there should be children as well and elderly. And what's more, this, this, um, this interpretation would assume that Hieronymus Bosch was an Adamite. And we know for sure that he was a devout Catholic. Indeed, he was a member of the Brotherhood of our Blessed Lady in his hometown of Bosch. So it perhaps doesn't make a lot of sense, this second interpretation, although I like it. The third one, what I've called the existentialist interpretation. And for this one, we need to rewind to the first book in the Bible, the Genesis, and then hit pause. We have God, he's created Adam and Eve, and he has a plan. He definitely has a plan. And this, interpretation suggests that perhaps Hieronymus Bosch is trying to describe God's original plan. What would have happened 
if Adam and Eve had not eaten from the apple, if they had obeyed God's orders, and if they had not been expelled from the Garden of Eden, if they had not sinned, if they had continued living in the Garden of Eden as they were supposed to. Here are two images. It's the two top sections of the panel to your left the Garden of Eden, and the panel in the middle. They look exactly the same. The same greens, looks like the same garden, the same buildings. Indeed, the same horizon line. If you were to connect the two panels, these two, the, the, the line would connect. So it appears that we might be talking about the same garden, the panel to your left and the center panel. Genesis 1. Verse 28, God blessed them, etc., and said, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, etc., etc. Well, in the middle panel, we could argue that they have done a good job of multiplying Adam and Eve. There are a lot of people. It would be hard to fit more people in the middle panel. So if we look at the middle panel and we and we accept if we, that, that, that this might be a representation of God's plan if things had not gotten wrong, if Adam and Eve had not eaten the apple, if they had not disobeyed God, it would make sense. Adam and Eve only put clothes on because they ate the apple. They only put clothes on because they sinned. They only became aware of their nudity and their sexuality and everything else because they sinned. So the middle panel, if God's plan has had gone as planned, it might have looked a bit like this. Carefree people, happy in their innocence, just having a good time in the Garden of Eden. There are problems, though. There are problems. Uh, I've placed a, a pregnant lady here. Um, from a famous painting, by the way. But um, there are no children again, and there are no elderly. However, however, and I'm not going, I, I, I'd rather not get into a theological debate here, but if we go back to the book of Genesis, chapter three, I'll start with death, the one below. It appears, and I would say that we could argue that death did not exist, was not invented until Adam and Eve were sent from the Garden of Eden. And that's when God says that you shall, uh, for dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. So we shall return to the earth. In other words, we will die. And most people die after a long and wonderful life. In theory, we could argue that Adam and Eve, if they had not sinned, would have lived forever. Young, not so young, but in the Garden of Eden. They would not have died. They would have been possibly eternal life. Pregnancy is a little more difficult. In chapter one, God tells Adam and Eve that they should multiply, but doesn't, isn't, very, isn't very specific how that would happen. Uh, he does say in verse 16 of, of Genesis 3 that, um, that there will be uh, sorrow and you will bring forth children and sorrow. And that, I mean, I'm not saying that's pregnancy, but um, from what I've heard, it's, it's, it can be tough pregnancy at some stages, but in any case, perhaps Hieronymus Bosch had no idea what God intended, but perhaps pregnancy as we understand it, in other words, children and babies were not in God's mind when he created the Garden of Eden. As I said, there can be flaws to all interpretations. But there's more, there's more. Hieronymus Bosch, I believe, makes a very, a bold statement Remember, we're talking about a triptych, and I've completely ignored the third panel so far, hell. And a triptych is always read as three panels as a whole. You've got a, the panel to our left, Garden of Eden, the panel in the middle, which would be the Garden of Eden, as it should have been, everyone having a good time. And then suddenly there's hell. How, how do we end up in hell? How, how, how does, how does God cre God's creation, how if Adam and Eve don't sin, do we end in hell? And I would argue that, as I said, Hieronymus Bosch makes a bold statement and, and, and suggests that our human instinct would eventually override God's creation. 
that we were doomed. There was no way around it. And he suggests this, I would argue, and we're going to look at it now, by, by putting little, little clues in, 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 in the left panel, the panel on our left and the middle panel. If you look at this painting right here, the, this, the, the, the left panel, down here at the bottom, there's, there's a kitty, for example. We're going to look at that now. And then in the middle is the, um, is the tree of life. Now, here's our kitty, and uh, she's caught a lizard, most likely killed the lizard and going to eat the lizard. And then below the kitty, well, there's two birds that are, are eating what looks like a frog. This should not be happening. Animals did not hunt and kill other animals at the time of creation. When Adam and Eve uh, were made, animals lived in peace with each other. Indeed, there's a verse, again, uh, in, in, in the book of Genesis, that says that God created um, the, a grass like meat. That they, in other words, animals and humans were all vegetarians at the beginning possibly, but they definitely should not have been killing each other. That happens after Adam and Eve are sent away from the Garden of Eden. The tree of life or the tree of knowledge, perhaps the same tree, right in the middle, right in the middle, there's an owl. Now everyone loves an owl nowadays, but back in the Middle Ages, owls were not liked. They were always related to evil. So it's an odd place to put an owl kind of watching the scene right there in the tree of life or the tree of knowledge the middle panel we assume that the garden of eden went as planned everyone's multiplied and they're having a great time in this carefree world and yet things are happening in the back there's a pond and around the pond are there's a group of men mounted on different animals and beasts, and they're parading and showing off. And inside, in the pond, excuse me, are, uh, there's, there's groups of women. And this kind of reminds me of perhaps how male animals parade and show off in front of female animals. Remember, this is a carefree world. We rely on instinct. There is no sexuality. There is no sin. There is no shame. So. You know, just like our pets, our, our cats and dogs, you know, eventually multiply. Well, we must assume that in the Garden of Eden, they would have done something similar. But if you look at what the women are doing, okay, here's, there's a group here that they're actually watching the men. And here, they're also watching the men. But then you've got uh, one here. She's, she's bored. She's holding her head. She, she, this carefree world just is leading to boredom. And everyone knows that boredom is the, is it the playground for the devil. And these ladies, these ladies are just, they're, they're ignoring the men. They're just talking amongst themselves and here too playing. And she's, get, she's just tired of it all. She's leaving the pool. Things are happening in this ideal Garden of Eden. 5,000 years later, humans are getting tired, perhaps. I love this image. It's been, it's seen, a, it's been seen a million times. But just like we, just like our, our pets, our cats and dogs, are not aware of their sexuality and do not look for privacy, humans, you could argue that humans in the Garden of Eden, who were not aware of anything either, just like our pets, would not have looked for well, what this pair, this couple has, has looked for. They're hiding away in this muscle, getting up to naughtiness. My point being is that we could look at lots of different parts of the middle panel and we would discover, again, lots of naughtiness. It seems that Hieronymus Bosch is saying that even if the Garden of Eden had continued, even if Adam and Eve had not eaten from the apple, it didn't matter. We were doomed. We would become naughty, we would be naughty, and we would end up in hell and punished. And hell, well, it's a favorite. Almost all, if not all, well, all the uh, mortal sins are are represented here. It would take us hours to go through it all. Uh, but just as examples, we've got here a, a knight with a golden goblet. He might represent, I don't know, uh, greed or, or wrath. Knights usually are violent and he's being punished there. Perhaps lust, 
in this image. Perhaps gluttony, greed again here. There's a lot happening. Or vanity. I, I find it, I'm going to say amusing, uh, for lack of a better term, that uh, it seems that vanity is always represented by a woman. I, I can't think of a single artwork where vanity, the person being punished is a male and not a woman. Well, anyway, there she is looking in the mirror of herself and being punished in hell. Unfortunately, I do not have an answer for the duck fish person in the pond reading a book. I am clueless. If you have an answer, please share it with me or contact me or email. I'm sorry, that one I was not able to answer. Now, before we finish, before we finish, I would like to share a curiosity with you. Uh, I ran into it some years ago when I was doing my research on the Garden of Earthly Delights. And um, it's this image we've seen a million times. It's uh, this musical score that, that's been printed on the gentleman's backside. And uh, it's taken us 500 years, I guess, um, to put music to it. But, you know, someone has, someone eventually did. And on YouTube, I found, um, I found someone who, who had put music to this musical score. So what I'm going to share with you now is music from hell, or as the gentleman calls it, butt music from 500 years ago. And with this, we shall conclude. Mm -hmm.